How do we begin to describe the amazing, extraordinary Dr. Francis Bartlett Kenny? Spending an hour with Fran was a master class in life, in how to live a life well lived. When Fran came into something, whether it was a conversation or to sit next to you at an event, all of a sudden the electrons changed. Many lives, mine certainly, and probably every other student she touched, life would be different without her. You know, it's often said that, that vision is the ability to see the invisible. She always could imagine what was, what was not yet here and track it, chase it into being. She is a reminder of when you plant seeds of acceptance and encouragement and kindness that all things are possible. People that underestimated her found out she's not only gonna crack the ceiling, she's gonna destroy it a million pieces. Einstein was wonderful when he said, you can look at life in two ways. You can look at it as if nothing is a miracle, and you can look at it as if everything is a miracle. And that's what my parents taught me. Fran was a role model to so many of us. I have known Fran since 1965 when I came to Jacksonville University as a freshman music student. And I was lucky enough to be a student under her leadership when she became the Dean of the College of Fine Arts. Fran was always, from that time on until now, so encouraging in the classroom as well as outside of the classroom, Dr. Kenny was tough. She had very high expectations for herself, and that spilled over to the people around her. The thing I remember, geez, even as a teenager here, is when Fran would come into an event or a room, you would think she would go over and start mixing and mingling with the people in the nicest suits with the grayest hair, but she didn't. Fran would always come in and kind of make her way to whomever was taking the tickets or putting the coats away or signing you in. It was just Fran's natural style to ask everyone, how are you doing? How's it going? Are you being well treated? She was inspirational. I remember my first meeting with Dr. Kinney very well. It was December of 2010. I'd been at JU for about three months as an assistant professor of music and director of the choirs. And Dr. Kinney showed up to my first concert with the JU Choral Ensembles at the holiday event. And she made a point of introducing herself. I knew, of course, who she was. And she spoke with me after that concert with such appreciation and understanding of all of the music that the, that the choir sang. I mean, Fran was a product of choral music. She loved music, but she had a special place for singing. And it comes from her childhood, growing up in Story City, Iowa. That is good Lutheran hymn singing country. And when she made it to one of our concerts, I always knew that I had in the audience a very special set of years who really appreciated what the students were doing on the stage. It was so natural because there was music all around me all the time. Um, with my mother playing and my father singing, and so it was just natural. Music was everywhere. We'd never talked about this, but I always imagine Fran coming to Jacksonville almost as like a, like she's colonizing a new planet. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I try to imagine what the scene was like for a humanities professor in a city in the deep south like Jacksonville, knowing Fran, as I know her, she had to take real inspiration and just pride in altering that. From a young age, you know, there were certain expectations of her as a girl, a young woman, and then as a married woman, but she didn't really let those hold her back from having big goals. Seeing that it's possible to do it. You just have to work maybe a little harder or maybe a lot harder, but you can do it. And you can't just let people tell you no. You're going to have to work. There is no other answer. It's important to know every piece of the journey 
and you can't skip any of it. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care what your situation is. You, you, there is no substitute for work. She was the first of so many things, as most people know, and didn't ever think of herself as the first woman this, the first woman that, even though she was. It was just the next thing that she wanted to do. I was a student here in the mid to late 60s, graduated in 1969. I went to work in a large medical center. I got fascinated by the way the brain works and ended up working for some neurologists and neurosurgeons. I loved that job, I loved working on patients. Um, but when administration made decisions that I thought were not wise, um, then I decided I've got to put myself in a position where I can make a decision. So I went and got a master's degree in business and health administration. And that's really because people like Dr. Kinney encouraged women by her example as well as by her advice. You can do this. You have to be able and willing to take risks if you're going to succeed. And every step along the way in her life where there's been a choice, where she had to take maybe a little bit of a risk, maybe a lot of risk, she was willing to do it. So it was the early 1960s, and Fran was a delegate to the National Association of Schools of Music annual conference. This is the national body of music executives of colleges, universities all over the country. So she describes a smoke-filled hotel ballroom in Chicago where the assembly was meeting. She walks into the room. She's the only woman delegate. There's no chair at her desk. Someone had taken the chair away, presumably as a, as a statement. You, know, you don't belong here. When the gentleman to her left or right, I don't remember which, saw that she didn't have a chair, well, Fran stood, the me meeting began. This gentleman, he stood up, with a cigar hanging out of his mouth, so Fran says, took his chair, put it square in front of Fran's desk, and offered it to her. She smiled, she sat down. That individual was none other than Howard Hansen, one of the deans of American music in the 20th century, dean of the Eastman School of Music. That's a beautiful story of persistence and who Fran was, you know. When faced with that opportunity, she rose above it. She had so many obstacles in her way, but none of them stopped her and I don't I think she even actually saw them as obstacles. It was just, this needs to be done for me to get from point A to point B. I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to get my doctorate, and I'm in Germany during the American occupation, and people are spitting on me on the street, and there's no chair for me because I'm a woman, but I'm going to get my doctorate, and she did it. From what she experienced as a female versus what I experienced as a, a black male growing up in the 50s and 60s, uh, and especially North Florida, and across the country. And we both united and come arriving at Jacksonville and, and different perspective in, in her field through uh, uh, academics and me as, a, as an athlete. Uh, but we, we end up on the same team together and uh, that I was able to connect with Dr. Kenny. And we shared so many times about the stories, what, what it was like for me as a, a young black kid growing up and she as a female growing up. The way Fran did it, it wasn't activism. Fran made the inroads she made and made the points she made to mostly white men through the established channels that the white men had established. She proved to them that their rules might be unfair but that she was smart enough to work with them and still make her impact. That's a special kind of smart. I don't want to be where I'm not wanted, and I don't want to get anything because I'm a woman. I want to get it because I deserve it. It took us a while to actually recognize that Fran's agenda was you. It's so frequent that people will say, well, how did you get this? You were the first women, or how'd you do that? You, you were an American in Germany, or how'd you do that? You were too young. And Fran was never working an agenda. 
and it takes everybody a minute. It's disarming when you realize what she really wants to talk to you about as a young person, as a female leader, as a business executive, whatever it is, is you, your interests, you have special skills. I've never heard anybody say as frequently as she did, you have something unique to offer, but you need to bring it forward. Whenever anybody thinks of Fran, that's the first thing they think of is how optimistic she was. But I found it was at a deeper level than just rose-colored glasses. It was really based in the fervent belief in the development of human potential. Um, I was with her when she would speak to a server or someone in a restaurant who had a really sonorous voice, and she would say, do you sing? And the person said, well, I, I do sing in the church choir. And she said, well, you should really develop that. You know, your voice is beautiful. You should really develop that potential. There's an old adage, people may forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. She always made you feel like you were the only one in the room. Or if you were talking to her, there might be 50 other people more important than you, but she's still gonna treat you when she's talking to you with really un uncommon empathy and decency, respect. Whenever she would see me at a function, she would pull me in close, take my hand, and introduce me as her favorite former star student. She made everyone feel that way. She had such a gift. It truly is a gift, an artistic gift, something that you're born with, of making you feel like you're the most important person in the world. And that's a gift of communication. It's a gift of sincerity. And you either have it or you don't. And Fran had it. When I came into the dean's office in 2018, she turned into a great mentor, a great advisor, a counsel. Here in this office, her office, I have a photo of her above my desk behind me. Fran was a guiding force during those few years. Fran taught me that if you wake up in the morning with a full calendar of appointments and events, and because you took time with a student or with a faculty member at 9.15 in the morning and it put you behind and your day took a life of its own because of it, that that's really okay. And that actually that is why we do what we do, is to focus on people, especially our students. Fran really brought that into focus for me. She had an incredible memory. Um, People, students, former students would walk up to her, she could tell them where they sat in class, they would verify that. And I know too, she had it scientifically verified at the Mayo Clinic with neurologists telling her she had the brain of a 35 year old when she was about 100 years old. For three or four years, uh, we took a group of students to Fran's house on or around her birthday to sing play instruments, celebrate her birthday. And true to Fran, she'd ask each student about them. She needed to know where they were from, where they went to high school, what they hoped to do. A year later, there might be three of the seven students that were there a year before that were returning, and then four new students. Fran knew everything about those three students that they had shared with her a year ago. On her 100th birthday, we did a local radio show, she and I together. The first call came in, and the, they hit it in the studio. Now, we're not seeing anybody. And you hear, hi, Fran. And Fran said, oh, Jimmy, it's so nice of you to call. <laughs> and to watch the moderator of the program say, you can't know who this is. She goes, oh, sure, I recognize him. He went to, he took our classes back in, it was like 1969 or 1974. Fran remembered everything. She tells the tale of my husband taking a humanities course from her. And she said, David, don't you remember you sat in the third row the third seat on the left-hand side of the room. <laughs> My husband said, I don't even remember taking a humanities course, but you know what? <laughs> yes, I did. My fondest memory is being Fran's date to concerts, especially the holiday concert of the orchestra. So in 2018, when we celebrated the naming of the college, we marked that occasion at the holiday concert of the orchestra. And there I was with Fran in the front row accompanying her. And when it came time to sing the audience Christmas carols, the sing-along, 
I had the sweetest memory of harmonizing with Fran. We had an inside joke. We would trade harmony parts. So I would sing bass for a while. She'd sing tenor up an octave, just for a couple of measures. And then I'd kind of sing the alto part and we'd look at each other and kind of grin and chuckle. I do remember on Friday afternoons, um, we were required to attend something called the music collegiums. Students would practice or faculty would perform and Fran would always come in and sit down at the piano and fire up some um, Broadway tunes. So it was always just fun loving whenever Fran was in the room. We always enjoyed having her around. She has an extraordinary place in, in my heart and I showed her this, this particular photo for a special reason because of my two moms. My mother, Maddie L. Gilmore, and uh, Dr. Fran Kenny, my second mom, for all the students here. Uh, she's been a mom for a, many, many years for a, many students. What I'm really gonna miss from Dr. Fran Kenny is the conversations that we would have, uh, phone calls. And you can bet when you have a phone call with Dr. Kenny, uh, the minimum time is going to be a half an hour to 45 minutes. And uh, those things I certainly will miss. You can look around and see physical aspects of a legacy. But what she really did was instill a culture of service and care and relationships. Fran always encouraged people, and I know she said in her book that she would make a choice every morning when she got up to either be happy or not be happy. And that is something that I try to remember. I know it is difficult for all of us, but I think that will be something that I remember about Fran. We have a student I know who wrote a note to Fran that I was at liberty to see when we were packing up her things and it said thank you for showing me my future. So that's a student in 2018 when Fran was about 100 years old and she had had that impact on that student. It's just amazing. Oh, I wear a size 19 shoe. Dr. Kenny, her size, difficult to fit. Cannot fit in size, especially the print that she left here at Jacksonville University. This university's been around since 1934, but there was this window of time, this kind of magical window of time between 1958 and when she passed in 2020, when Fran kind of flexed her muscles as a person and a persona, and things that leap out at you today, persistence, optimism, respect, trust. I mean, these are things she wore as part of who she believed in. She idea that today's Jacksonville University reflects everything Fran believed in, because I believe it should. We can all carry on Fran's legacy. I think it looks like being civil. I think it looks like caring for each other. I think it looks like in this age where we are too focused on the things that keep us apart from one another, to remember that our highest calling is to look after each other. We do that as teachers. We do that as students. That's how we can best put Fran's legacy to use. I think it's very important for young people to have hope. And I think to realize how very important it is to keep a positive view on life. And no matter what the challenge is, know that there is something there for you and that you have a DNA that nobody else has, which means no matter what age you are, you can do something no one else can do.